Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's live stream peak in Los Alamos Mountaineers program. The presentation will start right around seven o'clock. We're just getting everyone seated here in the planetarium. Okay, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's hybrid presentation and meeting uh, with the Mount Most Los Alamos Mountaineers. Uh, before we get started, I want to make sure everyone's aware that pre this presentation is being recorded. I am Beth Courtright, the Operations Manager at Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I will be the moderator for tonight's talk. I do want to acknowledge our wonderful members and donors for your generous support. Uh, and for more details about PEAK programs, uh, please visit peaknature.org. And now I'll pass it over to Sylvie to start the Mountaineers meeting. Thank you, Beth. Uh Welcome to our October joint meeting. A couple announcements from the Mountaineers. Mark your calendar for 2022 Popuri on Wednesday the 14th at Fuller Lodge at 6 p.m. And as in the past, it's potluck format. So the Popuri is typically, all right, the screen is coming back on. Um, five or six 10 minute talks so send your suggestions to rodney mcgrady or juliana fesseden uh, in a moment zach will discuss the open position for the mountaineers board uh, of directors bill will follow me with the trip report and then sherry kelly and jean Dewart will be our main presenters today and our november meeting will be on November 15th, the week um, before Thanksgiving. Okay, here comes Bill for our trip report. Okay, thank you for being here in person or virtually. As usual, the Mountaineers have had their share of adventures over the last uh, last few weeks, and I'd like to tell you about some of them. Hmm, uh-oh. We're having, oh, we're having some, for you folks in Zoom land, we're having some AV problems projecting, but, uh, so far, so good again. So let's see, I don't see John here. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, some nighttime photography sent by John Saracino, which I find quite remarkable. This is out in the back country of California near Mono Lake. And this is a picture which shows not only the Milky Way, <clears throat> but also the air glow, which is the atmosphere recombining after it was activated in the day by sunlight seeing both the lower altitude green air glow and the higher altitude red air glow. So it is just remarkable what one can do nowadays with electronic photography, and this is an example of it. All done in the dark of night. Okay. Other adventures. This is a shot from uh, a back, uh, bike packing trip near the Gilman Tunnels uh, by Eric Burnside. And the Mountaineers, thanks to Lana Martin, trip leader, thank you, Lana, went to the top of Wheeler Peak towards the end of September. Uh, <clears throat> a private backpack led by Olivia Lee, I believe, went overnight from Cantalone Lakes. Uh, southbound from there to reconnect with the highway. And this is a picture of them in the uh, <clears throat> wonderful autumn color country of northern New Mexico. And of course, one of the favorite times is around the campfire watching the evening fall. Anita Bozier <clears throat> and Olivia were up in the South San Juan wilderness hiking in for a day trip to one of the lakes, Duck Lake. And a and a couple others, you know, seeing the beaver works, seeing the fall colors. Now that's a beaver dam. Tony Taylor, who's here tonight, went with Stuart to the Via Ferrata in Ure. Via Ferrata being a way to uh, navigate on a rock face with uh, permanently built in cable protection that one uh, ties into from one's harness, which means you can. Uh, it's an Italian name because it was used by the Italians in World War I in the northern part of the country when they were fighting the Austrians. But nowadays in peacetime, here we are navigating a cliff face, uh, hanging on with protection of this uh, somewhat elaborate and very sturdy protection system. It's a long way down, and that looks like a little bridge. 
Anything to add, Tony? So as Tony said, this is near the ice park and it's free to all comers. Martin Staley went, spent three weeks trekking in Nepal. And here's a picture of his, his, his adventures as you, one can see one major peak after another in the Himalayas. That's Lhotse. Lhotse. Oh, Nootse. Sorry, we're losing some of the pictures off the sides. And that's Everest and Lhotse. Franz Cordova and Chris Foster went to Haleakala and hiked the standard trail across the uh, very barren high altitude volcanic landscape. And here's a couple shots from that. Just barren. Well, it's not completely barren. There's some mountaineers, um, or rather, um, you know, a few high mountain and very exotic tropical high altitude plants to be found there. Uh, and then six of us, there were in fact two walking tours of uh, Italy this year. Patty and the ladies had the first trip. I was on the second trip walking through Umbria. And it wasn't all walking, as you can see. It's a lot of time at the restaurants. Uh, uh, sampling the best of Italian cuisine, uh, views of the countryside, and a couple a pre-trip, which I took, and Melissa, former student of ours, uh, former Lanel student who stayed with us a few years ago, and my Swiss cousin, and that peak in the background is just what I like. That's the Matterhorn. And a post-trip to the Amalfi Coast, which is a little bit up north of Naples on the west side of the Italian peninsula uh, by Evan Rose and Felicia. Now back to a mountaineers trip. We had a major llama trek that I'm just back from a few days ago. That was led by BJ Orozco, our llama outfitter. There's the llamas. And we covered, you know, <clears throat> went kind of from the south end of the country that we keep exploring again and again to the north side coming out of Deer Creek. Rugged, beautiful country. You know, here we are in the first day in, six participants. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more to say about this at some point. Maybe maybe this will be a slot at the potpourri. There is a la canyon called Ladder Canyon. Why, why is this canyon called Ladder Canyon? Because the only way to get down into it is to go down the ladder. That's a permanently installed ladder. Here we are at a high pond and also moving down the Escalante River. And uh, so that's the past tense, what we've been up to, which is a lot. Uh, upcoming trips, you know, keep posted. People put day trips up at relatively short notice and uh, you'll know, grab them when you, when you see them. You know, sign up for the Mountaineers, get on the email announcements, track the webpage. There's a lot going on in terms of, um, of um, uh, regular outings that are coming soon. There is just this very weekend, Cecile is leading, a, it's a beautiful, it's a somewhat ambitious uh, loop trip into the Valle Caldera from its southeast corner, uh, led by Cecile Jemez, who I don't see here. And, um, and then <clears throat> we're going for a long weekend to Bluff, right at the beginning of December staying in town, hiking during the days, one slot available for that. If you're interested, let me know. Uh, one bedroom available at this point. So that's what's happening on the trip front. Oh, and I've got a couple more things cooking as, as usual. Uh, here's trips that I have reserved that I um, have yet to announce, but will soon. Thank you. All right, before we get really rocking, we have a little bit of Los Alamos Mountaineers board business. Uh, the bylaws obligate us to announce our slate for the next year's board before we vote on it. So we'll vote next month and we will announce today. So we had a nominating committee. Uh, it was me, it was Carrie Tallis, it was Joan Lucas, and we mostly filled out the slate except for the secretary here we have a big question mark but during dinner jean Dewart said that she was thinking about being the secretary so who thinks that jean should be the secretary 
That's what I thought. <laughs> um, as well, uh, we have a call out for maybe a helper for Juliana Fessenden for programs. So if you have some ideas for people that haven't given a talk, but maybe have something interesting to talk about, uh, maybe you could help Juliana. Um, so let us know, either let me know or Juliana directly. I think that's it for the board and we'll come back next month and vote. And back over to Beth. Okay, just a few logistics for this presentation before we get started. Uh, our presenters will be taking questions via Zoom chat and from our in-person audience. So for those of you at home, you can find the, the chat feature in the Zoom app menu bar. Uh, you can type your questions to the peak moderator, that'll come to me, uh, in the chat window anytime during the talk, and then I'll read them at, during the Q&A at the end. Please remember that not everyone in the room, everyone in the room with us has a microphone. So there may be a, a delay for you at home when uh, we're listening to a question here in the live audience. But don't worry, um, we'll be back on in a second and the presenters will repeat the question for everyone to hear. Uh, after the talk, you'll receive a short evaluation. Please do take a moment to fill that out. It'll be in your email. Uh, and your, your input just does really help us improve our, our future programs and report to our funders. So without further ado, I'll hand it back to Zach to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Beth. And you all should come if you're out in Zoom land, because today we start having snacks again and a social before the meetings. So there's a reason other than seeing all of our smiling faces to come in person. So today we've got some locals giving us a talk. Uh, very excited to have Jean and Sherry here. Uh, Jean, of course, long-term weather forecaster for the laboratory. When it was four in the morning and they were deciding if they should cancel work because of the snow and everyone should just go skiing, that was Gene. And then Gene retired and they were so bereft that they stopped having snow days entirely. Isn't that sad? Uh, Sherry, actual geologist, uh, geologist at New Mexico State. And we learned at dinner that if you're thinking about putting a hot tub in your backyard and piping it from actual hot springs, Maybe need to talk to Sherry because she's keeping track of all that water. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to them and we will have a talk. Thank you, Zach. Sherry and I are real excited to talk to you about the Quebradas region of New Mexico near Socorro. It's really in our own backyard and it's a fabulous place because the geology and the wonderful hiking and biking and car camping you can do there. So I hope that you're inspired to go visit this lovely place. So for those of you who are not here, these are a picture of your speakers tonight. And Sherry, being a geologist, is on the right, has this cool t-shirt that says, just one more rock, I promise. So you don't want to walk in front of Sherry with a backpack because your backpack might be full of rocks when you get to the end of the hike. And um, then I'm on the left, Jean, and uh, that's a picture at the Quebradas. For me, this set of trips that we took this last couple of years started with a road trip about 10 years ago where I was going to Tucson to visit friends from Los Alamos down to Tucson and then across to Las Cruces. And I stopped in Lordsburg at the New Mexico Welcome Center there. And if you ever happen to be on Interstate 10 driving through Lordsburg, I recommend you stop. It's really a beautiful building. And do you know in Welcome Centers, they have these big racks of brochures about all kinds of features that are available in the area. And so I dutifully went through and I found a brochure that said Quebradas, amongst some other things. And I gathered them up and put them in my car and they got home sometime later. And I put them in my map basket at home. And then I kind of forgot about it. Um, but then in 2020, when things were shut down because of the pandemic, I started to go through the map basket to see about places we might want to go. And I came across the one for 
the quebradas. And what I learned after now reading it um, is that the quebradas is part of the Bureau of Land Management Backcountry Byway Program. And it turns out the BLM has 54 of these sites across the Western United States where they've written guides to a specific area. And there are five of them in New Mexico. The um, backcountry byways, um, the purpose of these, um, these roads are to get you off the beaten path. That's what the BLM goal is. And there are four types of roads that are um, that these byways are classified by. Um, type one are, are roads that anybody can drive with a regular car. Type two, which the Quebradas is, is uh, um, stated to, that you need a high clearance vehicle. Type three um, asks for a four wheel drive road and the ability to drive it. Um, the, <laughs> Um, the, there's an alpine loop in southwest Colorado that goes between Uray, Silverton, and Lake City. And that's one where you need a four-wheel drive and you need to know how to drive it. And then there's type four. There's a few type four, which are actually a trail. Um, it might be for a mountain bike. It might be for a motorcycle, um, but uh, not a regular automobile. So there's 54 of these across the Western US. So when you're traveling, you might look for these uh, because the BLM has written guides to them to, to um, help you see what you're, what, where you are. So I found that there's actually a whole geologic guide to the Quebradas backcountry byway. And Quebradas is Spanish for the breaks. And it's a 25 mile road east of Socorro, New Mexico. There's Socorro. And the northern end, so it's this yellow, yellow road through here. The northern end takes off, you get to it by leaving I-25 at the village of Escondida. Um, and at the southern end, it's east of the town of San Antonio. And you'll also know, notice that um, it's just north of the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. And although you can't see it on the map, it's just south of um, the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge. And I know a lot of people go birding um, at these uh, refuges. So you could combine it with a trip to go see the Quebradas. So now I'm going to switch over to Sherry to tell us why this is such a cool place to go see. So I'm going to start with a, a, a story. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the geologic history of this particular amazing area and uh, explain why it is, is so remarkable. Let's see if I can do this without causing havoc. OK. <laughs> um, so this is a geologic map of the uh, Permian rocks that are exposed on the uh, Quebradas. In this area here, right along the, the, these black lines are faults. Right along this area, there are some really old rocks, Proterozoic or Precambrian basement rocks, and we'll see some pictures of them later in the presentation. And then this area in here is covered with uh, Pennsylvanian limestones. It turns out that uh, these Precambrian rocks were formed about 15 kilometers in the subsurface about 1.65 billion years ago. And they gradually worked their way up to the surface. And about uh, 320 million years ago, there was uh, so were, were some highlands in northern New Mexico that were shedding some uh, water, uh, sediments in the, in the form of streams and, and depositing on top of these of the Precambrian basement. And then later, uh, we got a, a, a sea level rose and uh, much of New Mexico was inundated with uh, an ocean. And in that ocean, there lived a lot of uh, marine animals. And I'll show you some pictures of those in just a, a few minutes. And then uh, 
after about um, 300 million years ago, the North American continent uh, moved into, uh, further north and got into some uh, latitudes where things were a little bit drier, and the, some mountain ranges that had formed during Pennsylvanian time were shedding materials. And we start getting some really spectacular red bedrocks called the Abo Formation. And these uh, units uh, were derived from this highland up by Taos, and a big stream uh, uh, system came down through the uh, Socorro area and down even in, as far south as Las Cruces. And then uh, as time went by, the drying continued and sea level came back up. And we start getting um, a, a rock unit that's called the Yeso formation. Yeso is a Spanish word for gypsum. And this particular unit, especially in uh, the Socorro area, contains very thick beds of gypsum. And that uh, plays into our story a little bit later. Uh, sea level uh, came all the way up, and we get uh, barrier islands of the Glorietta uh, sandstone, and then full marine conditions of the San Andres. And these are the main rocks that one can see from the the uh, the byway. Now, um, along the the byway keyed to this this book are a number of of stops and i'm just going to show you a few examples of some of the things that you can can see along the way first place first stop is a place called bursum spring and it's a pull out on the side of the road and you uh there's a, a kind of a rough road that leads down into this canyon and right here there's a, a, a standing body of water that is almost always there. And you can may, maybe make out this, this wall of rock. So uh, it, it turns out that the, this particular area has been affected by three episodes of deformation. One is ancestral Rockies, which is not very well displayed in this particular area. The second is Laramide, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. And the third is a uh, is what has created the landscape that we see today. It's called uh, the Rio Grande Rift. It's a place where New Mexico has split apart, and uh, the crust is then uh, get elevated uh, temperatures and uh, a lot of volcanism. And this particular feature here is one of the Rio Grande Rift faults faulting Pennsylvania limestone against some Eocene vol uh, uh, volcanic material that came out of a big caldera center to the southwest of uh, Socorro. This place is a great place to go hiking and biking and all kinds of things. There, there's a, a mountain bike trail here. You can walk back in here and find fossils. Uh, you can walk even further back in here and and find fossil leaves. So this this is a one of a, a very uh, fun place to, to to visit. The second place is is at stop two, and it's in this really brick red abo formation. And uh, there's a little the, the, uh, there are little markers all along the the road and. At, you know, so the, the, there's a sign post that says stop too. You pull into that parking area and walk uh, to the south across the road down a little canyon. And there are some spectacular uh, plant fossils. This is a root mat uh, here. Here's a, you know, some kind of fern type leaves and uh, mud cracks. At, at stop three, uh, you pull off to the uh, west side of the road and uh, walk down a little uh, canyon and you walk through the Pennsylvania section and there are beautiful marine fossils. Here's, a, here's some crinoid stems and here are some uh, horn corals. So lots of, lots of good fossil collecting. And as a structural geologist, this is my favorite part, uh, 
there are, are there's just tons of deformation out there. There's all kinds of folds and 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 faults. Uh, you can see here that you basically have a an, an overturned fold. Here is a uh, a stack of um, of sandstones that got broken again and again and again and just stacked up uh, on top of each other. These formed uh, during a, a mountain building event that happened about 75 to 45 million years ago that's called the Laramide orogeny. And it is the mountain building event that formed the Rocky Mountains, the Sangre de Cristos, the Front Range of Colorado, and, and that sort of thing. But it turns out in, in the Socorro area, it behaved, the, the, it manifested itself in a very, very different way. Uh, one of my colleagues, a fellow named Steve Cather, has worked out a, a model. Here is, let's see, here is Socorro. Uh, here's where the Cabradas is right now. And this is up on the Colorado Plateau. And my, my friend has come to the realization that in the place where you have the Rio Grande Valley now, there was once a Rocky Mountain style uplift that has since collapsed down into the, the rift. And the evidence for this is looking at sediments that were deposited out here on the Cabranas, indicating that there was some kind of a Precambrian cord uplift uh, that, that shed sediments off in, uh, in this direction. And as a consequence of this compression, the squeezing. Here we have this, this mysterious uplift that we can no longer see. Uh, it, it was shoving rocks up over this, uh, the, the uh, Permian rocks off to the east. Now, I mentioned earlier that the section is full of gypsum. And so this particular area behaved very, very differently than, than all up and down the uh, rest of the Rockies. And we have these big low angle faults sliding along on the gypsum. And I think in Jean's next set of slides, uh, Mary and my dog are, are standing next to one of these amazing uh, faults. And here's an example of one of those low angle faults. This is not an erosional unconformity. That is a low angle fault. So uh, uh, scientists find uh, the Cabradas a beautiful place to explore. You will find this a, a beautiful place to explore because the uh, landscape is wide open. There's lots of beautiful country and lots of cool rocks. All right. So, um, so we did two trips down to the Cabradas. One in April of 2021 that I'll talk about. And then Sherry will talk about the one we did this last spring. Um, in, in 2021, we did a bike and hike, and um, Sylvie, Jean, Mary, and Anetta, we started from the south end, so we drove past Socorro uh, down to San Antonio and came in from the south, and our goal there was to stop at the Owl Bar and Cafe to have a green chili cheeseburger. Um, Gwendolyn Dawn, Rick Kelly, and Rick Lawrence came from the north, and we met at guidepost six in the middle for camping. Um, thanks to Rick Lawrence for a number of these beautiful photos that we're about to see. One kind of caution uh, from the south, um, you go on a county road for about five miles before you actually hit the byway, and it's really washboard. It's not four wheel drive or anything, but it's really washboard. Um, but it is well marked with these um, BLM signs. And uh, from the north, you leave I-25 uh, at the village of Escondida. And it's about four miles of paved road to get in from the north side. And um, the biking we did was uh, what I think is called now gravel bike uh, a style. Um, um, there's our team, uh, Sylvie, Jean, Rick, Anetta, Dawn. So I think, I think Gwendolyn took this photo. 
um, we all took mountain bikes, uh, but um, you can see from the photo on the right side that um, it's a smooth packed road. Uh, they, they clearly take a road grader in there from time to time. So it would have been really perfect for gravel bike riding to the byway itself. Um, and um, um, sometimes the road is up high and you have um, long views back to the west. Um, this is back to the Rio Grande Valley, the green, um, and this is the Socorro. And you can tell that because this is M Mountain, um, the, uh, the mountain that's just above. Is it Socorro Peak? I think officially. Um, and the School of Mines has put a big M on it. So, so you can see uh, quite a ways. And then uh, this is a picture of those beautiful red rocks in the Abajo. I'm sorry, the Abo uh, formation. But uh, just one of the cool things around here is, you know, something else is going on there and something else is going on there. Um, so um, as Sherry said, it's really a, um, it's really a cool place. Uh, there's so much of geologic interest. And uh, every trip should have an ecologist uh, on board. So we had Gwendolyn Gallagher and um, uh, this is the uh, northern part of the Chihuahuan desert uh, environment. And um, spring was coming on, not, not completely there yet, but um, um, the um, flower on the left is in the mustard family. Um, and uh, the Ocotillo on the right uh, hasn't quite bloomed yet. We uh, switched gears in the afternoon and uh, hiked up uh, um, Salinas Creek, which crosses um, crosses the byway and uh, um, you know it's just really great to have uh, four geologists with you to uh, you know look at every nook and cranny to see what you're see what you're looking at and so i highly recommend that you reach out to the geologist sherry rick don creer rick lawrence um, and I, I bet there's a half dozen other members of the club that are geologists so um, it, it was really, really terrific. Um, uh, sandstone ramparts, and and this is the uh, this is the Salinas Creek, and uh, we did it car camping style. Um, there's a lot of different places to camp um, because you're not really in a forest of juniper or pines. Uh, we all camped in. Uh, vans or the back of pickup trucks um, but there's plenty of room lots of flat spaces and uh, so uh, we brought our own water all our own food and um, um, brought our own uh, portable toilet uh, on sunday of this weekend um, um, the group split up into two and uh, the top mountain bike riders in the group uh, drove the cars up to the north end of the uh, byway and there's a, a single track route up there that you can find on um, Trail Forks, the Trail Forks app. Um, and, uh, but Gwendolyn and I, um, we rode from the midpoint of the, um, of the byway where we camped and we rode up to meet them. And you can see Gwendolyn has the guidebook in her hand. So we stopped at every, uh, at every of the stops on the road um, to take a look at them. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. And, and uh, by good luck, we, we met up about the same time when those guys finished their mountain bike. We, we got caught up to them. So, so it, was, it was really fun biking there. Um, and um, gosh, uh, spring was coming on. Um, um, this is a, a mesquite creosote uh, um, ecosystem. And uh, the, the spring was coming on. Um, it, really beautiful place, um, and you can see the road there through the through the breaks. Um, uh, this one was um, mid-April uh, when we did this trip in 2021, and now back to Sherry for the 2022 trip. So uh, Rick and I have a little house in Socorro. The name of the street we live on is the School of Mines Road. And a dozen years or so ago, the city of Socorro got some funding to do some beautification of our street, and we have benefited from it mightily. Uh, these are tulip trees, and it turns out in the spring, uh, they all bloom at about the same time, and now they are all turning red at about the same time. It's a pretty spectacular display.
So our trip in, um, uh, in April of this year took us to uh, Arroyo del Tajo. Uh, and, and there's two, two things that, the, that this particular area is known for. One is this spectacular slot canyon in the background. And the other are is some very beautiful uh, pictographs. Pictographs are, are paintings uh, on on the wall, and there's uh, there's quite a, quite a few uh, painted on the, uh, the the sediments that were deposited when the Rio Grande Rift, this extensional feature I mentioned earlier, uh, formed. So here's a little closer view of the the canyon, the rocks in here are these 1.65 billion year old granites. And then this feature here is a fault. It's a fault plane separating Precambrian -Cam -Pre granite from Miocene aged uh, Rio Grande Rift sediments. And the interesting thing about this it, it, it turns out there's about six of these Precambrian outcrops uh, up and down the uh, in a north-south direction on the Quebradas, and every place you're near that fault, there's mineralization. So there's uh, fluorite, barite, uh, in some places to the north it was actually mined, uh, and quartz veins. As a consequence of the fact that this and you can see it's very highly fractured. As a consequence of all the alteration, we've never really been able to get a good date on this rock because it's, uh, the minerals you could date are so altered. Here we are in the, in the canyon. And as I mentioned, there's, there's mineralization all through here. And this is an example of, of one of the, the veins running through the rock. This one uh, in particular had a little bit of calcium that, that grew at the in the last stages of mineralization. And uh, there were some places where uh, it was very narrow and, and fun. Here's Sylvie trying to get through <laughs> a, a tight spot. And then the, uh, we were encountered a little water in our it, it, Sylvie made it through, but the dog didn't, so we had to find another way <laughs> through. He does not like water. So here is a picture of Gwendolyn and Don looking up at a cliff. And they're looking at it with their binoculars, and the feature that they're looking at is right here. And Sylvie got some amazing pictures of a beehive. To the point where you can actually, she was able to photograph the bees. Uh, this, we had a little scintillometer with us just to uh, kind of playing around with it, but there was nothing radioactive at all going on in that particular uh, area. Um, there were, uh, as we were coming back out, there was a place where there was a, a, a hard layer in the Santa Fe group uh, rift sediments that had had been undercut by an arroyo and was collapsing, so there was this kind of cool little cave. So this is a picture of a feature of, uh, that we see commonly in New Mexico. There's one of these at the top of the Sandia Mountains. Uh, this is the Great Unconformity. So on the the left here, we have the the Precambrian basement rocks. And sitting on it is the Pennsylvanian Sandia uh, formation. Uh, this is 1.65 billion years old. This is about 320 uh, million years old. So there's 1.3 million years or billion years of time missing across that boundary. Here's a, just another view looking at it uh, taking off across the landscape. And again, you can see quite a lot of alteration uh, right at the right at the boundary. So when you, so you, as you come through this canyon, you, you 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 climb up across the 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 rift fault, and you walk through the the, the 
uh, narrow canyon, end up at the great unconformity. And then uh, we've got, gone a couple of different ways. Rick, Rick and I have done this hike twice. And uh, this is just a, a getting up on, on top of the, the Precambrian granite, looking out across uh, the, the valley. Here again is M Mountain, Strawberry Peak, the Ladrone Mountains in the distance. And just this really cool landscape. Uh, so this is an interesting outcrop in that it is, uh, most people think of crystalline rock, uh, things like granite as not being able to um, conduct water. <laughs> but clearly this, this outcrop uh, has had a lot of iron rich fluids running through fractures in the, in the granite. And here's, here's a picture that Jean took. What, what kind of clouds? S -s very good. Uh, um, you can't have a talk with a meteorologist without having one cloud picture. So um, we were fortunate. Of course, what's the windy season in New Mexico? It's the spring. And these are lenticular clouds, um, uh, usually indicative of high winds aloft. Um, but we didn't have, it didn't warm up enough that day. Um, to have a lot of mixing of the atmosphere. And so we didn't get the high winds down to the surface. We just got to see the pretty clouds. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. And here we are back at the, uh, at the parking lot, looking back over the, uh, the uh, Proterozoic basement uh, uh, hills. And then in the background are the Yeso uh, formation. Uh, so, um, just want to point out a couple of things in addition to this cool book that you can get online or uh, you can uh, uh, you can go to Socorro and, the, and you can just pick up a free copy. You know, the, the, the fun thing about the Quebradas is you can, as Jean was pointing out, make quite a, a weekend of it. You can go to the, the New Mexico Tech campus, you can go to the Mineral Museum. You can go to the Bureau Bookstore and find cool books. Uh, this this is our new uh, uh, Parks and Monuments book for the southern part of the state, and there's a write-up about Quebradas in it. And we just had about a month ago a big old field trip with a bunch of geologists from all over the state. Um, and, and there's a lot of wonderful, if you're a geo geek like me, there's a lot of wonderful information in that book. Then once you get done uh, uh, hanging out on, on campus, you can go to the Bosque del Apache, you can go to the Cabratus. There's just, there's um, un, unlimited uh, recreational opportunities in the Socorro area, especially this time of year. With that, I will turn it back to Jean. All right. Uh, so completes our visit to the Quebradas. Um, uh, spring and fall is really a great time to go. Um, so any questions, especially for the geologist specialists? <laughs> the question was, ca uh, can you camp anywhere? And yes. Um, um, People have camped over the years in various places, so you can see where there's some fire rings and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, pretty much, you could camp almost anywhere. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of private land in there. There, there is one in holding, or a couple of in holdings. But all in all, it's BLM land, and you can just uh, camp wherever you want, or hike wherever you want. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and it. Okay, so the, 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 the question is, where did all that material from the 1.3 billion years go? Um, it, it, it has been eroded uh, through several events. There were, in, in, th in this part of New Mexico, we were kind of in an elevated region during much of the early Paleozoic, so from 500, uh, million years ago to about 320 million years ago, this part of New Mexico was high. In contrast, the area to the south of Socorro, say around Truth the Consequences, the Bio Mountains down in the um, Las Cruces area and so on, 
that was an ocean. So there is some of the record that just never got deposited up, up here. So that's, that's where, that's part of the story. And the rest was just uh, lost during the um, assembly of the North American continent, which is a, a, a thing I almost need a map to explain. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, people in the room are thinking. We do have a few questions from uh, our viewers online. Uh, the first one is about the legality of fossil collecting. And there were a couple of questions about um, collecting fossils on BLM land. Can you tell us more? Okay, so vertebrates are a big no-no. Um, everything else, uh, 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 invertebrates, I don't think there's any regulations. Do you know if there's any about the, the plants? Yes, okay, you can't collect fossils to resell. Now, one thing I will comment about is that at this stop, I took these pictures probably about five or six years ago. I went back there recently and these features are no longer there. So, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, but I don't think there's any uh, I don't think there's any specific rules about that. You just kind of would hope that folks would understand that you, you would like your, your kids and your grandkids and, and, and so on to, to see these features and not take them to, to sell them. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question from online, um, what sorts of animals did you see out in that area, if any? What kind of, uh, let's see, we, we, there's, there's javelina out there, there's coyotes, um, rattlesnakes, uh, lizards. What, did, did you guys see anything else out while you were out and about? It was sandhill cranes, yes. It was a real thrill to see javelina. I think that's the first time I'd seen them in the wild, uh, so that was really cool. All right, so how long does it take to drive that section of the byway that you showed on the map in the beginning? Say someone was just sightseeing, driving through. I would say it's 24 miles long. It's, it's not fast, super fast driving. A uh, couple of hours. But you would want to stop. <laughs> you really do want to stop. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, a uh, question about the BLM type two roads. What do they mean by high clearance in that context? We were dri driving Subarus and, and uh, a, there was a Volkswagen van, van. Yeah, it, they, they generally maintain those roads pretty well. Back in the early days, there, especially after the monsoon season, uh, you, you could go out there and the roads would be in pretty rough shape. They'd be washed out. But the BLM has uh, put in quite a few flood control structures in the past decade or so. And it, 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 it generally it's in very good shape these days. Okay, and I did find a good link for that. Um, there's a couple links now in the chat for those of you on Zoom. Uh, okay, let me get back to my next question. Uh, Jean mentioned an app. We just like um, you just say that one more time. It's called Trail Forks, um, and it has uh, mountain biking routes uh, all over New Mexico. I know that all over the all over the Western U.S. Probably more than that. Great Trail Forks app. Thank you. All right. Uh, would you recommend driving south to north or vice versa? Or is it doesn't matter. Uh, it's organized driving uh, north to south in terms of, of the numerical <laughs> stops. Uh, and, that, and that's how the guide is set up too. Um, as Jean points out, uh, it, the road, there is that connector road that is not very much fun to drive. Uh, generally, when we, we go out, we go in from the north and then we just come back out. Uh, to Escondida, uh, back to the north. But then you would miss having a green chili cheeseburger at the Owl Bar. <laughs> that and, is okay. Gonna, just, that is an important. Just saying. Point. Or or one at the Buckhorn. Yeah, there's competition in town in San Antonio, and 
<laughs> okay, I'll keep watching the chat if anybody has last minute questions from Zoom. Anyone else in the room here? That was my understanding. I'm not an expert on that, I'm sad to say. But yes, that's, the, that was my understanding. And the question was about the root mats on the left. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear the yeah. question. But. Yeah, the, the question is, are, are the root mats on the left related to the fern leaf on the uh, up in the uh, upper uh, right? And uh, I was with a, a fairly famous Permian sedimentologist, and that was the impression he left me with. But I did not ask him specifically. I'll keep watch just in case a hand shoots up or somebody chats. But uh, if those are all the questions, I just want to say thank you again to Jean and Sherry for sharing these trips with us tonight. Uh, everyone, please look out uh, uh, for that quick survey coming to your email. And if you're interested in attending more PEAK programs, we have some great ones coming up. Uh, we talked. We mentioned in the beginning, Cecile Hemes is leading the Joint Peak Mountaineers Fall Hike in the Caldera this weekend. And this weekend is also Hallow Weekend here in town. We have family-friendly activities, a movie here in the planetarium, and, and lots more. So you can get on the website uh, for more information and to register for those. And if that's it, thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening. And everybody, especially that came in, um, saw us in person we really want to see your faces so uh if you can uh come come on over here to the nature center um for the next one uh, november 15th and with that i'll say good night and thanks again gene and sherry